Hello and welcome back to yet another GCSE revision lesson. Now, one of the biggest challenges that students face when they are studying the conflict poetry in Edic Cell's anthology is literally where to begin in terms of the quotations to remember from these 15 poems within the entire anthology. Worse still, you need to make sure that you talk about language, form and structure. So you need to be really strategic when selecting the relevant quotations. So what I thought would be easier, a better approach to take is summarizing all 15 poems in a mind map and I will show you the three most essential quotes. If you forget everything else from these poems, remember just these three quotes and I'll show you how you can tie it to language, form and structure. So let's begin with the first poem in this collection. This is A Poison Tree by William Blake. In terms of form and structure point to make, remember that it's written in a very predictable rhyme scheme. It takes an AABB rhyme scheme. Now the first quotation to remember is when the speaker who's really angry against their foe talks about my wrath and my wrath. And here the quote my wrath my wrath is repetition. That's a structural point. What this illustrates is how the speaker lets this destructive emotion grow within them against the enemy. The second quotation is when they talk about how they let it, this feeling grow and grow and they sunned it with smiles. Sunned and smiles is sibilance, this is language. What this is illustrating is this destructive emotion keeps on growing and growing and growing and getting worse. And the third and final quote, which ends in a very climactic way for this poem, is we learn that this emotion bore an apple, okay? So this metaphor, bore an apple, is a reference to the Garden of Eden, okay? This original sin. And what this is illustrating is this destructive emotion is eventually gonna cause a really terrible fo uh, fallout. And in other words, in the poem itself, we learned that the foe ended up being killed. That's the first poem within this anthology, and these are the language, form, and structure quotations that I would select if I were writing about it. The second poem within this collection is The Destructor, Destruction of Sennacherib. Now, in terms of language, form and structure points, remember the first thing you need to mention is to do with form and structure. It's written in an AABB rhyme scheme, okay? Let's talk about the first quotation that I would select if I were writing about this poem. Now, the way that the Assyrian army is described initially as being like the wolf on the fold, this simile shows and creates a sense of tension from the opening of the poem. We're really scared for these Hebrews in Jerusalem that they are about to attack. The second quotation, which illustrates this sudden miraculous shift as God sends his angel of death to protect them, is the quotation, angel of death, ellipsis, face the foe. Now here, the key language technique to point out is the alliteration of face and foe. And what this obviously illustrates is how God is going to engage in this miraculous rescue. The third and final quotation from this poem is when we learn that this, this Assyrian army and these forces, as a result of the angel of death, they melted like snow. Again, this simile towards the end of the poem is really, really powerful in showing how God stepped in to rescue the people of Jerusalem. The third quotation, or rather the third poem within this anthology is extract from the prelude. When you are considering form and structure, remember that this poem is written in blank verse, okay? Now, the first quotation I would select if I were writing about this poem is when the speaker at first expresses a lot of confidence. They steal this boat and they say that this was an act of troubled pleasure, okay? The stealth act of troubled pleasure. This is oxymoron, this is a language technique, and what this obviously illustrates is their initial confidence. This confidence shifts into fear of nature because they see this horizon and they describe it, this mountain as huge peak, black and huge, that runs after them. Here, you want to talk about, in terms of structure, the repetition of huge, and this is illustrating the dark side of nature. The third and final quotation that I would select for this poem is when the speaker now starts seeing the fearful and threatening side of nature, and they are really haunted by it because they see no pleasant images of tree, sea, sky, okay? Now here, what I'll probably talk about is language belonging to the semantic field of nature, trees, sea, and sky. Those are the three quotations that I will select from the prelude. The fourth poem in this collection is The Man He Killed by Thomas Hardy. In terms of form and structure, remember that it's written in an ABAB -A -B rhyme scheme. The first quotation I would suggest talking about is the exclamatory sentence, 
many a nipikin. Remember, exclamatory sentence is a sentence that ends with an exclamation mark. This is a structure technique. What this is obviously illustrating is a speaker thinks that if he'd met this soldier who he killed in different circumstances, actually they might be best friends, he could treat him to a drink at a pub. The second quotation that I would suggest, which illustrates the speaker's growing sense of anxiety, but also his intense guilt, is when he speaks about how he shot at him, ellipsis, my foe, of course. Now here, the verb shot, as well as the noun foe, illustrates the speaker doesn't quite even understand why they're in this war. Remember, obviously they were in the Boer War, but they're probably quite a young soldier. They don't understand why they even saw this person as an enemy. And they're trying to justify the reasons why they killed this man. But of course we can see that they feel really guilty. The third and final quotation from this poem is when the speaker reflects on how quaint and curious war is. This is an exclamatory sentence. This is what makes the man he killed an anti-war poem, okay? Remember that Thomas Hardy was very much against the Boer War and he wrote this poem almost as his protest and how it traumatized a lot of these soldiers. The next poem within the anthology is of course, Cousin Kate. Now, in terms of form and structure, remember that the poem is written in an A, B, C, B rhyme scheme. Now, the first quotation I would suggest, which illustrates the speaker's anger at how she has been used and then cast aside by this Lord is when she says that she was his plaything and his love. I would talk about the juxtaposition of these two adjectives, plaything and love. We can see here that she was basically exploited and mistreated by this man who she thought loved her. Of course, this man then marries her cousin Kate, who is purer because she's not slept with him. And this is illustrated through this second quotation where she states, you grow more fair than I, you grow more beautiful than I. Now here, this declarative sentence, which is a structural point, illustrates the speaker's perhaps feelings of jealousy towards her cousin, who was the one that was chosen by this Lord. The third and final quotation that I'll select from this is, however, the speaker from this affair with the Lord has a child. And she says, this child is my son, ellipsis, my shame and pride. Now here, the oxymoron, which is a language technique, shame and pride, what this illustrates is that whilst she knows that society is now going to see her as a fallen woman, she's actually very proud of this son. And remember that cousin Kate, the one that ends up marrying the Lord, is unable to bear a child for this Lord. The next poem in this collection is Half Cast by John Agard. Now, in terms of form and structure, remember that it's written in free verse. The first quotation that I would suggest remembering, which is hopefully straightforward because it reiterates the title, is when the speaker says, explain yourself what you mean, when you say half cast, okay? So you say half cast, there's repetition there, okay? So of course here we can see that the speaker is really angry at this person who probably said something quite racist to them. The second quotation that I would select from this poem is when they're talking about Tchaikovsky, the famous pianist who mixed a black key and a white key, okay? So the juxtaposition of black and white, okay? So this oxymoron, which is language, what this is illustrating is a speaker wants to show the absurdity of this racist term, calling somebody half caste, seeing them as half a person because they're both black and white. Because what the speaker is actually saying is sometimes this type of mixing actually creates something very beautiful. The final quotation from this poem I would suggest is when the speaker repetitively says the whole of your mind, for example. So the whole, the whole of you, okay? Now here there's repetition, but also of course they speak using patois. Now, what this illustrates is the speaker is actually showing that this racist person, they're the one that's half a person because they are so close-minded. The next uh, poem within this anthology is of course, Exposure. Now, in terms of form and structure, remember that the poem is written in ABBA rhyme scheme. The first quotation I would suggest from the first opening stanza is when the speaker talks about the merciless ellipsis, winds at nivus. This personification is really powerful in illustrating how nature is in conflict, in war against the men. And of course, nature is quite dark in the way it's destroying these men, killing these men who have done nothing to it. The second quotation, which obviously illustrates also nature's horrible uh, way of destroying these men, okay? Actually, what's really interesting about this poem, which was set in World War I, is that it's nature that's killing the men rather than the active combat with the opposing side is the flakes, the snowflakes that flock, pause, and renew. Now here, the root of three, flock, pause, renew, 
illustrates nature being this destructive force. The third and final quotation is the repetitive or the repetition of the phrase, but nothing happens. This is ironic because a lot of people at the time used to think that when it came to war, the men were always fighting, they were always fighting, but actually they had long periods of waiting and it was during these periods that nature attacked them and froze them to death. The next poem in this collection is The Charge of the Light Brigade. Now, in terms of form and structure, make sure you talk about how it is written in dactylic diameter. If you're not sure what that means, Google it, find it out. Okay, I'm not gonna go into an explanation here because I wanna try and make this video as concise as possible. Now, the first quotation I would suggest for Charge of the Light Brigade is when the speaker talks about how the light brigade, the British light brigade charged into the valley of death. This metaphor, of course, is an allusion to Psalms 23, okay? These men who valiantly, even if they knew that they would be killed because they were outnumbered, they still valiantly charged into this battle. The second quotation is when it's now describing the horrific deaths against the Russians because they were stormed at with shot and shell. Here we've got a lot of alliteration and what this illustrates is the horrific way that these men die. But on the other hand, even if they knew they were gonna die, they die with these patriotic values intact. They die like heroes. The third and final quotation I'll select from Charge of the Light Brigade is how it ends with describing the noble 600. This exclamatory sentence at the end is Alfred, uh, Lord Alfred Tennyson's way of telling us to never forget the sacrifices of the Light Brigade. The next poem within this collection is Catherine, and this poem is written in free verse. Now the mother here is illustrating this inner conflict that she feels between letting her daughter become independent, grow apart from her, but she also has this inner conflict and this inner desire to still mother her and to still be close to her daughter. This is illustrated when we can see that the mother finds it really hard to let go of these memories and almost this idea of her daughter being her child, because she says, I can remember you. Now here, this opening declarative sentence is really powerful in illustrating this inner conflict that the mother feels. The second quotation from this poem is when the speaker says, our struggle to become enjambment separate. And of course here, the enjambment means when there's no punctuation at the end of a line. What this illustrates is the speaker is trying to let her daughter be independent. She's trying to accept that her daughter is becoming her own person, but there's this struggle, this constant friction. The third and final quotation is when the speaker refers to that old rope tightening. Old rope, this is a metaphor for this connection, this umbilical cord, and she feels really, really sad and she tightens up when she thinks about her daughter becoming more and more distant from her. The next poem within this anthology is War Photographer. Now, in terms of the way the poem is written, it is written in free verse, okay? So that's the form and structure point that you could make. The first quotation, which illustrates and actually depicts the photographer who's taking all of these pictures of all of these victims at war as almost like a predator, is when the speaker states, I seek out the tragic, the absurd. These two adjectives are really powerful in conveying almost kind of the immorality of the photographer as he goes around taking these pictures rather than maybe helping these people. It's almost like he's taking these pictures to parade them in the West where the pictures are going to be developed, okay? That's the first quotation. I would suggest the second quotation is how he juxtaposes the suffering of people in you know, countries that are war-torn versus the really comfortable plush lives that people in England and the West take for granted because he juxtaposes sun-gilded girls' ellipses with small girls staggering. And here there's a lot of sibilance. What this is obviously illustrating is the horrors of war, but also perhaps the fact that we, in places that are peaceful, actually take our peace for granted and we don't really care about what's going on on the outside. The third and final quotation which illustrates how this small girl who had a baby and then obviously abandoned that baby once there was another war, okay? So we learned that this girl let out a dark scream. This metaphor is really powerful in illustrating firstly how war has robbed her of her innocence but also the inhumanity of war. The next poem within this collection is Belfast Confetti, okay? So this is obviously talking about the violence in Northern Ireland. Now the form and structure point to make is remember that it's written in free verse 
The first quotation to remember is when the speaker says it's raining exclamation marks. Now this metaphor is really powerful in showing that this war has almost robbed him of even a way of articulating his fear and his panic. And of course, this is uh, this war is breaking out in a place that he's, this is his home, okay? And we can see here that war is really traumatizing him. And you know, it paints a really vivid picture of the battle that's happening around him. The second quotation is when the speaker is running away and they describe how I know this labyrinth. Here, it's almost like this allusion to the Greek character Theseus and the Minotaur, right? So when he's trying to go through a labyrinth in a place where he, you know, kind of knows a little bit, but it's also showing the threat, the looming danger of death. The third and final quotation is when the speaker wonders why can't I escape? And this rhetorical question towards the end of the poem illustrates how war has entrapped him. The next poem within this collection is The Class Game. And in terms of form and structure, it is written in free verse. Now, the first quotation, which a speaker repetitively refers to is, how can you tell what class I'm from? Now, this rhetorical question is really powerful in illustrating the way, the prejudiced views that middle and upper class people held towards them. The second quotation is when the speaker refers to, and they speak in a very colloquial way, in a very informal way, they say, because we live in a corpy, corpy meaning council flat. Again, here, they are saying that basically society is judging them based on where they live. The final quotation, which juxtaposes middle class existence versus their working class existence. Okay, they work harder than middle class people, but perhaps they, they earn less. Therefore, middle and upper class people look down on them is when they speak about, and in this uh, rhyming couplet, they, stay, they say that their hands are stained with toil, question mark, perfume and oil. Now, this rhetorical question, as well as the use of rhyming couplet, creates a really interesting juxtaposition of working class people who arguably work even harder than middle and upper class people. However, society still looks down on them. The next poem within this collection is the, um, the poem Poppies, okay? So Poppies is written in free verse. The first quotation to remember is when the speaker, this is the mother of the soldier who's gone off to war. It's not entirely clear whether he's died at war, but the mother thinks about the time when she was trying to say her final goodbyes to him before he went off to war. And she says that my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt. Now here we can see that the speaker really has this internal struggle. She wants her son to go out and fight in the war. This is really important. The sacrifice is important for keeping the country safe. However, she also doesn't want her son to face the prospect of death, okay? So of course, rule of three is used here, so flattened, rolled, turned, to illustrate this internal conflict. The mom wants her son to just stay with her for a little bit longer, but knows that he has to commit this sacrifice if her country is to remain free. The second quotation, which illustrates how her son is so excited at war, he's kind of a little bit naive, doesn't realize that he could potentially lose his life, is when the speaker describes how the world was overflowing like a treasure chest for her son. He was so excited to go to war, doesn't understand that maybe he could be killed, he could be wounded and so on. That's shown through this simile. The third and final quotation is when the speaker is getting closer to the graveyard, it's actually left ambiguous, okay? So we don't actually know whether her son has actually died and that's why she's going to the graveyard or if she's going to the graveyard to look at other tombstones and to even maybe reflect on her own son, whether he's safe out at war, okay? And we learn that the speaker is nervous because they say the stomach, Ellipsis, making tucks, darts, pleats. This is listing. Once more, we can see war, but from the perspective of family members. The next poem within this collection, so this is the second to last poem, is No Problem by Benjamin Zephaniah. Now, in terms of form and structure, remember that it's written in an ABCB rhyme scheme. And firstly, the speaker reiterates the title by saying, I am not the problem. Remember, of course, also the speaker uses colloquial non-standard English to describe society's racist views towards him. More specifically, if you maybe extend it to Benjamin Zephaniah, society's racist views towards him as a black man. The second quotation, which illustrates society's stereotyping of black people and more specifically black men like him is that he was born academic, ellipsis, branded athletic. Now here, this juxtaposition through assonance of academic and athletic shows how society assumes that just because he's black 
all he does and all he's good at is sports and society doesn't necessarily assume that he's good in studying and reading okay so obviously this is emphasized through academic and of course the alliteration of born and branded is also really powerful in him criticizing these racist views the third and final quotation is when the speaker ends humorously by stating some of my best friends are white. So he's like, oh no, no, when I say all of this stuff, I'm not racist, you know, some of my best friends are white. And it's an allusion to a very common way as uh, some people who are perhaps racist say, oh no, I'm not racist, some of my friends are whichever race that they are maybe criticizing, okay? So of course the speaker also ends humorously, but it's quite a cutting poem in criticizing stereotypes and racism. The final, quote, uh, final poem within this anthology is, what were they like? And it's written in free verse. Now the first quotation, which is illustrating somebody asking, okay, before the war in Vietnam, you know, did they use lanterns of stone? Okay, so this opening question, okay, what this illustrates is perhaps the speaker having a very narrow idea of Vietnamese culture and it's almost patronizing. Now the responder, the person who's speaking says, actually as a result of the war which destroyed the country and the communities, this is the Vietnam War, the light hearts turned to stone. And this metaphor is really powerful in showing how the Vietnam War really destroyed Vietnamese society. The third and final quotation from this poem is when the speaker ends by saying, who can say this is the person that's responding to the one that's questioning and asking about Vietnam? They say, who can say? It is silent now. Now this rhetorical question is immediately answered. This is what we call hyperphora. What they are saying here is because of the war, Vietnam, Vietnam was completely destroyed and innocent lives were destroyed as a result of this war. And of course, this is an anti-war poem that's criticizing the Vietnam War. So that's really it when it comes to understanding all 15 poems within the mind map. And of course, if you feel like, okay, I'm not entirely sure if I can remember three quotations per poem, maybe narrow it down to two. So select and choose for yourself which two quotations you want to go for and then use that as part of your revision. Thanks so much for listening.